Welcome to section 6.6, .6, where we're going to be taking a look at De Moivre's theorem and nth roots. Now, that's a, actually a little bit of a misnomer. While this is the title of the section, uh, here in day one, we're really going to be focusing on a lot of the basics, the foundational work of complex numbers. Okay, so this is going to include the imaginary plane, kind of how we manipulate uh, this value i, how we write complex numbers, the absolute value in the modulus, and finally, uh, polar form here towards the end. So. Um, yeah, just a lot of the foundational stuff that we're going to need as we head into day two next cycle, okay? So first of all, let's kind of remind ourselves of how the imaginary plane works, okay? Now, in a traditional Cartesian plane, we know that we have an x and a y axis. Um, and, you know, we basically use those with Cartesian coordinates uh, to talk about a horizontal and a vertical change from 0, 0, or movement from 0, 0, right? What makes this a little bit different when we're talking about the imaginary plane is that, yes, we still are going to be focusing on two kind of distinct aspects, but unlike coordinate pairs that, say, have an x and a y coordinate, these are really going to just be a single number, and we're going to be breaking that one number down, okay? So what exactly do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> complex numbers, broadly speaking, are defined as z is equal to a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers, and therefore there's going to be some like, uh, like a real component and some imaginary component, okay? So as we kind of consider this with respect to the work we've done with the x, y axes, um, we're actually going to refer to this as our real axis and this as our imaginary axis, okay? <clears throat> so the x axis will be real and the y axis will be imaginary or complex, okay? <clears throat> well. There are two main kind of topics I want to talk about. The first is that actually we know that uh, the real numbers are a subset of the imaginary numbers. And so the way we write that mathematically is that R is a subset of C. Okay, so we've used some of this notation before. Uh, effectively what this means is that every real number you've ever considered, <coughs> um, irrational, rational, uh, maybe integers, whatever, um, those are all actually a type of complex number because all that we have to do is say, a is some non-zero value, whereas B would be zero, okay? So it's quite possible to say that, you know, all those reals that we've looked at can exist on this plane. It's just that they would only exist on the real axis. They would have no imaginary component uh, that's discernible. That's, you know, kind of b besides the obvious zero I, okay? <clears throat> now, in addition to that, I want to make sure that we understand how I to various powers kind of interacts, okay? For instance, we know that i to the first power, well, that's the same as the square root of negative 1. There's really no other way to write this except by calling it i, okay? Um, if we then square this, we know that's the same as the square root of negative 1 squared. And because the square root and squaring are inverse operations, we're actually left with a purely real component, which again is a subset of the complex numbers, but there would be no discernible sort of imaginary component besides 0, right? 0i. Zero Let's try this with an i cubed. We know that's the same as i squared times i. And you'll notice that uh, we're, like referencing some of the work we've done up above is going to help us as we continue down the, down the list. i squared is negative 1, so I get to kind of swap that out. Negative 1 times i, well, that's just negative i. And finally, i to the fourth, if I were to try that, well, that's the same as i squared times i squared, so i squared squared, or negative 1 squared which we know to be 1, okay? What makes this unusual is that we understand that all the powers higher than 4 now have this i to the 4th kind of wrapped up in them as a factor, okay? And so what we try then with i to the 5th, we just say, well, isn't that 1 times i? 1 times i because it's the same as i to the 4th times i. That would give us i to the 5th. And that's the reason why we start to notice this pattern. i, negative 1, negative i, 1 i dot dot dot, okay? And so this allows us to quickly generalize to much higher degrees. For instance, i to the 807th power, I know that 4 goes into 807 201 times. So this is i to the 4th to the 201st, and then there would be three i's left over. Since this is 1 to the power of 201, I can basically ignore it. That's the multiplicative identity. And now that we have i cubed, well, we can just call that negative i. So you can quickly reduce these much higher powers so long as we understand the basic structure of how i to, a various, to, to lower powers kind of interacts, okay? All right, <clears throat> so what I'd like you to do now 
Now that we've kind of talked through those pieces, I'd like you to try to, to map these. We have real and imaginary components, and you can effectively think about this, z equals a plus bi, kind of like x plus yi, because y is going to be our vertical axis, and therefore that's the imaginary component, and uh, x is our horizontal axis, and that's going to be the real component. So why don't you try those and see how they go. Right, in the first case, negative 3 plus 4i. We can put a little dot here, and we just have to understand that that is a single number. While it feels like a coordinate pair, this is actually just a single complex number that we've just mapped. In the same way that on a real number line, you could say, hey, here's 2, and just put a single dot. Okay? In the case of v, negative 7 minus 2i, negative 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 minus 2i, we're going to be over here. So there's v. And 6i cubed, if you take a moment and consider that, that's actually the same as 6 times negative i. So this is negative 6i. This is equivalent to negative 6i. And therefore, we're down here. So that would be t. Okay? We've got our three imaginary points listed and graphed. Now let's talk about the idea of an absolute value. Okay? Now to understand what the absolute value is going to do in the complex or with the complex numbers, we have to first consider what it would do with, say, just a real component. I think it's going to help us understand what's really happening. So if I said the absolute value of x is equal to 3, and I want you to map these solutions, I think most of us would agree that if we plot a number line with 0 here, then our solutions could actually be at this location at 3 or at this location at negative 3, right? Because, after all, the absolute value of 3 is 3, and the absolute value of negative 3 is also 3. So how about we break that down a little further? What did we really just find? Well, in relation to 0, these are the two points with a distance from 0 of 3. So we can kind of read this as the distance to 0 is 3 units. And the key word there is distance. It's understanding that you're finding a, like some, some value, some distance away from a given value, like 0. Okay? So why don't we consider that on the complex plane now? Okay? Let's say we're looking at u or v or t. Well, the real number line, obviously, we would have limited it down to just a single dimension. Okay? That's what one axis offers. But the moment we add this second dimension, we now have this vertical component. And as a result, it means that you're going to have more options. I mean, look at this last example. Had I allowed us to work up and down, there actually would have been a whole lot of points right, that are three units away from 0. And had I allowed us to work in the third dimension, suddenly we get a sphere. right? We get this like, like sphere coming out of the page, both above and below it. <clears throat> so now that we understand that, maybe it'll be a little bit easier to understand what the absolute value is doing for a complex number. Um, this is also called the modulus of a complex number. Um, so when we looked at magnitudes of vectors, this same idea of distance came up. And so what we're going to do, we're just going to say that the, uh, what is it, the modulus, the absolute value of z, is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. Okay? So it literally behaves the same way as the distance formula has. Okay? This is just another way to talk about that same concept because obviously we're not working on the same plane. We're working on the imaginary plane now. Okay? So why don't you try this down below. It says below find the modulus of u, v, and t above. Take a couple of minutes and see how it goes. All right, so what I would do by looking at u up above, we have negative 3 and we have 4. And yeah, we can just take the square root of negative 3 squared plus 4 squared. We're going to get the square root of 9 plus 16, which gives us root 25 or 5. So that's the magnitude of v. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going back to, to vectors. That's the modulus of, of, of u, rather. Okay. Um, next up, we're going to have the modulus of v. Why don't we try this one? Um, well, v, we've got a negative 7 and a negative 2. Um, mentally, some of you guys may be doing this kind of in your head. Uh, that would be 49 and 4 when we square them. So that's 53 that we're taking the square root of, which doesn't simplify. And as a result, we're done. Let's take a look at our last one, then. We've got uh, the modulus of t. The modulus of t, we've got 6i cubed. We know that's the same as negative 6i. And effectively, we're just going to say that this comes out as 6. Okay? And that's because 0 is the real component. 
0 minus 6i. When we take negative 6 and square it, we get 36, and take the square root to get back to positive 6. So it might be helpful to note this one additional thing, that the absolute value or the modulus, of course, better be bigger than 0. So the absolute value or modulus of z better be larger than or equal to 0. Okay? Which kind of makes sense if you understand the, the meaning of a, you know, an absolute value. All right, <clears throat> and finally, let's develop this idea of a polar form, okay? So down below it says the polar form, also called the trigonometric form, of a complex number z equals a, b, a plus bi is given by blah. Well, let's develop this because you have been working with polar coordinates over the last couple of days, all right? And so we should understand them well enough to start manipulating what we've been working with, okay? So up at the top, we said z is equal to a plus bi. And looking at our graph, we know A would be on the real axis, uh, B is going to be on the imaginary, and therefore we can kind of think about this as the same thing as X plus YI, okay? And now that we understand that we're working with X's and Y's, not just this thing A and B, and we understand we're wanting polar form, we just need to ask ourselves what are X and Y in terms of R and theta. And that's where we should all agree that R cosine theta and our sine theta are sort of the typical options to swap things out. And looking those over, you'll notice, of course, that these have a common factor of r. So we could really just say this is r times the quantity cosine theta plus i sine theta. And that gives us our polar form. z is equal to r times cosine theta plus an i sine theta. Now, it's not required that you put the i at the end, but broadly speaking, uh, because i is, is effectively a, a constant, we know it's the square root of negative 1, and sine of theta can vary. That's really why we would decide to put this one out front. That's it, okay? So let's talk about what these values are. I just want to be really clear on what this means with respect to the complex number system, okay? And we know that a, as we just showed here, is actually equivalent to r cosine of theta, okay? because <clears throat> A was effectively X, and based on our work with polar coordinates, that was given. Same thing with B. In this case, it's going to be R sine theta. R, on the other hand, this is the part where a lot of students get confused. We know that R in the polar system, for the polar coordinates of a complex number, <clears throat> we know that R really was representing uh, distance, right? Well, distance was actually the same thing up above as we were talking about the absolute value or the modulus of what we were given. So we can go ahead and say that r is equal to the modulus or absolute value of z, a complex number, okay? <clears throat> Why don't we just write this in? Yes, it's the modulus. And it's also quite possible, it's maybe even more helpful to think about this as the distance from the origin to z. All right. And finally, we've got tangent of theta. So tangent of theta is equal to, well, you guys know we normally talk about y over x, right? Slope. Well, y over x in this case with the original uh, constraints would be b over a. We just need to go ahead and add one little side note. Anytime we deal with division, obviously your denominator value cannot equal 0. So where a does not equal 0. In the case that that were to happen, then basically we would be looking at theta where it's vertically aligned in some way, either up or down. And the nice part there is you already know what theta would be. Theta would be either pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2 or some coterminal angle therein. Okay, So again, you have a lot of options here. Um, the one maybe additional piece I would add here is that theta is then equal to the arc tangent of b over a. Because after all, that will allow us to solve for what theta is. Okay, so, <clears throat> so long as we remember that arc tangent allows the, uh, the outputs to be defined in the positive quadrant 1 and the negative quadrant 4, I think we're going to be okay when calculating these out. Okay, so down below it says to find the polar form of the following. We've got u is equal to 1 minus root 3i and v is equal to negative 3 minus 4i. Why don't we try this first one together and just kind of see where it takes us. So find the polar form. Well, 1 minus root 3i tells me that we're working in quadrant 4. So why don't we write that in? We are in Q4 just based on the positioning, right and down, okay? Now, next up, we know that to calculate r is effectively the same as the absolute value 
of, of z, right, the original number, in this case it's u, is how they've talked about this complex number. So <clears throat> to get the absolute value, we're just going to take a squared plus b squared, and that's going to give us r is equal to the square root of 1 squared plus a negative root 3 squared. And that gives us 1 plus 3, which of course is 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. So r is simply equal to 2. Nothing too fancy there. Now, looking these over, 1 and negative root 3, to calculate theta, we just said that's the same as the arc tangent of b over a. Negative root 3 over 1, well, that's just negative root 3. And if we consider the options here, there are two locations where this could occur. Thinking back to our work with the unit circle, we know that there are three very common slopes, root 3 over 3, 1, and root 3. We've also got a slope of 0 and undefined here, right? So as we're looking at the slopes of negative root 3, we would allow for this location or this one. And we just have to remind ourselves that we're working in quadrant 4. So hopefully, we're all okay with the idea that this could be 5 pi over 3. Now alternatively, you could also say that's negative pi over 3, had you just gone clockwise instead. So 5 pi over 3, negative pi over 3, and there are loads of additional options, okay? <clears throat> After all, we know that for any point in polar coordinates, there are an infinite number of options to label our r theta, okay? We had looked at that over the last couple of days, okay? Um, now, if I were to try this on my calculator, an inexact method, then we're going to take the arc tangent, making sure we're in radians. This is kind of the standard for these. <clears throat> As you guys have seen with polar coordinates, go to radians, okay? So the arc tangent of negative root 3. And as I pointed out before, we know arc tangent is defined in positive quadrant 1 and negative quadrant 4. And therefore, this would be the negative option. This is the same as negative pi over 3. If I wanted the positive option, we know that that's a full rotation later. I could simply add 2 pi. And we know that that's going to be the same as 5 pi over 3. So there we go. Just double checking our work and making sure that it makes sense to us. That's kind of the goal here. All right. I'd like you to try the next one. Um, feel free to work through that and kind of come up with your, um, your polar coordinates of a complex number. And I do want to point out that our final answer here on the first one would be that u is equal to r, which is 2 times the quantity cosine of 5 pi over 3 <coughs> plus i times sine of 5 pi over 3. And there we have it, okay? Next up, we've got negative 3 and negative 4i. Why don't you guys give that one a shot and see how it works? All right, we're kind of skipping over some of the work here. You should find that r is equal to 5, and theta is roughly 4.07, just using a similar process to what we saw. And therefore, we can go ahead and say that v is going to be, and this is where I'm going to estimate. Unlike the previous problem where we had exact values, this is an estimate. So we're going to say v is equal to 5 times a cosine of 4.07 plus i sine of 4.07. And there we have it. Okay. So <clears throat> hopefully the concepts are making sense, how we're simply talking about complex numbers in a new way using some basic equivalencies we've built over the last couple of days. Okay. All right, on the next page, you guys will notice that it's asking us to just apply a couple of rules here. There are some product and quotient rules for multiplying complex numbers or dividing them. And oddly enough, there is some sort of angle sum and difference that ends up occurring. So instead of kind of proving this, I just wanted to, to demonstrate them. So why don't you guys take a moment, write down the values of u and v at the top of the next page, and we'll see how you do applying those rules, okay? And when applied, you should end up with 10 times cosine of 9.31 plus i sine of 9.31 and 0.4 times cosine of 1.17 plus i of sine of 1.17, okay? Well, there we have it. You guys have begun your work with complex numbers in a couple different uh, numerical systems, both Cartesian and polar. And we're going to develop this idea of De Moivre's theorem and the nth roots and how we can work with those next class. I'll see you then.